So we will get started because um, we have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, basically trying to sort of talk about the future of a lot of different geopolitical issues. So um, I will briefly introduce our panelists and uh, what they're going to be discussing, just in case you don't have your program in front of you. They'll uh, talk about a different issue for about five, between five, six minutes, and then um, I have some questions, but I'm really hoping that you guys have some questions as well. So we'll open up the floor to um, some feedback or, or questions that you all might have. Um, so first, let's see, in no particular order, I don't know where everyone is sitting. Uh, right next to me, we have Noah Barkin, who's a senior advisor for the China practice for the Rhodium Group um, based in Germany. He's going to be talking about what is going on in China and uh, whether anyone still wants to do business there anymore, pretty much. Um, next to him, we have Mallory no Nodal or Nodal? Nodal. Um, she just landed from Washington, like literally just landed from Washington, D.C. Um, going to be talking about the very interesting subject of cybercrime, which is evolving, changing very, very rapidly, um, I think, than any of us are probably aware of, and especially with artificial intelligence now um, factoring in as well. Then uh, next to Mallory, we have Reinhard Budikhofer. <laughs> I did my best. Uh, member of the um, <clears throat> European Parliament from Germany. We're going to be talking about Russia and uh, Russia, of course, and uh, what's going on with Europe, and also how that's impacting the EU's relationship with China, because um, as we know, China has been um, sort of supporting Russia in various ways. Um, next to uh, Reinhardt, we have Andrew Shearer, who's the Director General, Office of Natural Intelligence from Australia. Also very interesting topic, talking about how geopolitical forces are reshaping global supply chains. Um, of course, we've all seen, you know, rapidly, <laughs> rapid changes with global supply chains because of COVID, but now we have conflict involved as well, and what will be the longer term impact in terms of how that might reshape markets or um, other sort of national security concerns and collaboration that might come into play. And then finally, we have Nico Lange, Lange, Lange? <laughs> sorry, my German's not great, senior fellow Munich Security Conference from Germany. Um, we'll be talking about the transatlantic relationship and how that might be affected by the upcoming US elections. And I have been told not to ask specifically what everyone's going to do if Donald Trump wins because he hasn't won yet. So. We're not gonna ask that question exactly. So um, we can start, um, I guess, really to my right uh, with Nico, if you'd like to go ahead and we'll see if this mic works. Thanks, Laura. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I apologize. Noah. <laughs> no worries. Nico and I, people often mistake us for each other. Um, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be talking, uh, I'm gonna be talking about um, whether China is still attractive to foreign investors, uh, and if not, who is moving out of the mainland and to where. Um, I think there's no doubt that China is less, has become less attractive uh, to uh, foreign investors, and there are numerous reasons for this. I would break it down into four uh, main reasons. One is China is going through a structural economic slowdown. Uh, and it matters for businesses, foreign businesses, if China is growing at high single-digit growth rates or low single-digit. Um, the policy environment has become a lot more challenging. Growing focus on security, uh, which uh, has been a hallmark of Xi Jinping's uh, um, uh, presidency uh, since the beginning, but with zero COVID, and some of the recent regulations, anti-espionage law, um, uh, rules on cross-border data flows, this really affects how businesses are thinking about China. Third would be rising competition uh, in the Chinese domestic market. And part of that story, of course, is local players have benefited from favorable treatment from Chinese authorities, whether it's through subsidies or uh, discriminatory pr procurement practices. And the fourth reason is geopolitics, uh, writ large. Um, Taiwan, I think the, the war in Ukraine has, has really 
uh, affected how companies think about um, uh, investing in geopolitical competitors or rivals. Um, so that has been a big impact. So if China is less attractive, what are companies doing to diversify? And I think first it's important to talk about what we mean by diversification because there are different definitions of this. There is, to put it simply, market diversification. So companies deciding um, to look for growth elsewhere in other markets, reducing their reliance on the Chinese market. This is the classic sort of China, China plus one uh, approach. There's manufacturing diversification, so that's actively shifting production out of China because the market in China has become so difficult. Uh, and then there's sourcing diversification, so replacing inputs, um, uh, reducing dependency on Chinese inputs in your, in your products. And what, what the some of my colleagues at Rodian Group have been delving into this in recent months, so I'm very lucky they've provided me with all their, all their data. Um, uh, and what they've found is that um, a degree of diversification is taking place in all these three categories that I mentioned, but it is primarily happening in the first, market diversification. So essentially what that means is that it's much easier to move a final assembly site to another country uh, than it is to uh, take Chinese inputs out of your products. Um, so where are companies going? The two countries that are attracting the most investment uh, at the moment are Vietnam, on the one hand, and Mexico. Uh, India is also attracting investment, but companies are setting up shop in India uh, because of the market here. They're not setting up shop in India in order to, uh, in order to export to the rest of Asia. So it's if you can make the uh, make the argument that there's a market here in India, then you set up shop here. You don't set up shop here just to, to send all over the world or, or to Asia. Uh, this is what our findings show. Uh, in the case of European firms, Central and Eastern Europe has become, has become uh, uh, more attractive. Uh, in terms of the sectors that are diversifying, electronics and consumer goods, so uh, these are caught in the, in the US-China trade war. Uh, information and communications technology. It's been very, it's, it's become very hard for foreign companies to operate in this ICT space in China. Semiconductors, we've had a wave of onshoring in the EU and the US. And electric vehicles where regional hubs are being set up ar around the world. So this is not a simple story. The question, you know, is diversification happening or not? It's very complex, but what our findings show is that it is happening, uh, and there are signs that we may be at the beginning uh, of what could evolve into a pretty significant shift in global investment flows. Uh, we probably, it'll take several years for that to become absolutely clear. FDI doesn't sort of change on a dime. It, it takes time. Um, but business, business surveys show that roughly a quarter of EU and US firms are either considering or proactively relocating manufacturing or sourcing outside of China. This is going to be a slow s process, as I said. Uh, and for now, we're not seeing uh, foreign firms making a clean break from the Chinese market uh, or from their Chinese suppliers. So this is going to take time. That's my main message. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Mallory Nodal, and I work at the Center for Democracy and Technology in Washington, D.C., which is a civil society organization. So you'll get my perspective on uh, cybercrime and how those efforts can be balanced from a human rights perspective because of the sector that I work for and I represent. Um, I'm a technologist by training. Uh, so one of the reasons I followed the cybercrime um, treaty negotiations in the UN uh, is also that follows on some of my work in cybersecurity, um, cybersecurity policy making, like inter-agency, inter-sector um, cooperation on cybersecurity over the years, um, and especially in you know, protecting and preserving strong encryption. Um, so the, the recent cybercrime treaty negotiations have 
stalled. Uh, I don't know if stalled is the technical term for what's happened. They've adjourned the final session because it wasn't uh, possible for the, for the delegates to all reach uh, negotiated text before um, this last session, which was already an extension. So it will resume in July with the hope that before the next um, UNGA cycle, they could, they could actually come up with a negotiated text. Um, that's more the recent update, but I think this it's important to contextualize this. So this is against the backdrop of um, also a lot of failed attempts at cybersecurity uh, treaties or cybersecurity agreements at the UN level in the first committee. There have been for many years now, I think almost two decades, been attempts to really um, codify um, the UN's role in best practice in cybersecurity cooperation. Now, cybercrime and cybersecurity aren't related. They're actually importantly distinct. I think cybersecurity tends to be a better framing because it actually allows for some degree of human rights where you know, cybercrime and things like that are very tightly in the realm of security, and so there's, there's sort of less, um, less focus there. But, you know, going back to the original point, though, I think that the cybercrime piece of the cybersecurity failures, um, maybe this ad hoc committee was an attempt to get somewhere, somehow, at the UN level. Because also remembering that in this context, the only thing that has been signed by you know the most countries is a more than 20 years old Budapest Convention, which is a European Commission document. It's not UN level, right? Um, so it's important. Like this process has been important, except from the beginning. And so my organization, I was accredited to attend as an observer. Um, so they did have accreditation process for non-member states as stakeholders, um, but that sharply ended after the first session. So one had to be accredited from the beginning to be able to follow the sessions. Um, a, a real problem for participation and oversight in that process. And also from the beginning, the main issue has been scope. The scope of these current, this current treaty negotiation is very wide in terms of uh, what is a cyber crime, because in a sort of ubiquitous digital age, any crime is ostensibly a cyber crime if it has something to do with a computer. Um, and also just in the m amount of um, actions that would be embedded in the treaty process. So it's, it's, you know, it's data sharing, it's also capacity building, you know, it's just a wide range of, of things that be, are being talked about because every state sort of needs, um, has, its own, has its own desires and needs and wants, so scoping has always been an issue. Um, I would also say that um, the other thing we've been concerned about is that um, you know, data sharing um, between a variety of different countries, but most um, notably the EU and the US, have been very, very carefully negotiated down to really intense details. And the Cybercrime Treaty, um, you know, because it's so widely scoped, really uh, sort of just bigfoot all of those very carefully negotiated data flows, um, data, um, Anyway, so so that's one of the main uh, another one of the main issues, and and more practically also a thing that became controversial is now that there are so many different kinds of data protection frameworks out there, um, how exactly to navigate that between requesting party and um, sending party, where their data protection um, standards may be lower or mismatched, and so that was quite a contentious piece. Um, I would also say that really, um, I'm going to speak from the US perspective as well, um, and where most, where I think that maybe this is the elephant in the room, or maybe people do discuss it more broadly, but the US is really um, in a different place than every other country in a lot of ways, because a lot of the data that's being requested or that, want, that countries would want are from US companies. Um, and the other difference is that the U.S. has um, a massive sort of diplomatic, you know, uh, reach, so that it has its own its own negotiated bilateral and multilateral um, agreements for intelligence sharing and other things with almost every other country in the world, which is not true of, of most other uh, other countries. And so it becomes um, really um, the U.S.'s positions on this have, have become something of um, a focus as far as my um, 
my perspective, I'm, I'm, while I'm based in the U.S. and based in Washington and in other capacities work with um, the State Department on things, I'm not part of the U.S. delegation on this. I'm, I'm a civil society observer. Um, and I just wanted to note that I think that, um, that plays into whether and how um, a lot of countries will then ratify whatever comes out of this treaty. So thinking about um, in the U.S. case, it won't marginally change. It won't change much for U.S. citizens, so it would be like fairly easy for for whatever treaty comes out to um, to be ratified. I think that is not necessarily true um, anywhere else. I think there, the changes that the cybercrime treaty would would um, precipitate in almost every other jurisdiction would be rather different, and some for the better, perhaps, is the argument. Um, so I think I, my time is, is up, um, but I just wanted to leave you with, I think, the, this question of, you know, can human rights be balanced in um, this current iteration of negotiations I, in, in what we think might come out of, of this ad hoc committee, and I don't think it looks great because it is so widely scoped. Um, it is. It has very little. There are very little guardrails um, for the ways that states would share uh, data. And um, luckily, we don't see outright threats to strong encryption, for example. But we do see um, issues with, um, for example, failure to gender mainstream. So not recognizing, for example, gender-based violence as a particular issue. Um, there's just sort of a lot of uh, contradictions, I think, in the process, and it just points to, I think, where it, it really, I think, has all come from where it started. It just started with such a vast scope that this, these last two and a half years have been about trying to narrow it with little success, and so getting at some of these finer details that we were able to negotiate in Budapest, that we were able to fight in amendments to Budapest, that we have been able to introduce in um, bilateral data flow agreements are, are just not present. So I am, I am actually exceedingly worried about that. Thank you. I'd like to start by, by first thanking ORF for having me and all of you for attending this session. The Lithuanian Foreign Minister Landsbergis this morning reminded everybody how difficult Europe found it to wean itself of the overwhelmingly strong dependency on fossil fuel uh, imports from Russia. Right after the um, full-scale invasion, you could have expected, therefore, that a very simple lesson would be drawn from that experience, namely that you should not allow your country to become economically dependent on any authoritarian regime. I must say that was not universally accepted wisdom. And there were some voices originally that um, did also prefer to ignore China's own history of economic coercion, which is quite rich. Leaders like uh, HRVP Borrell or the Chancellor Scholz or the Council President uh, Michel rather hoped that China would somehow help us reigning in Russia. On the other hand, there was a second more, let's call it more hawkish camp, led by President of Commission von der Leyen, also some uh, Baltic leaders. The UK was part of that, the European Parliament was part of that. And we felt that even though no limitless friendship has absolutely no limits, the term in itself was to be taken very extremely seriously. And um, I would say that now, so many months into that terrible war, the um, vast majority of the European public has come around to that point of view. And there are just enough facts to corroborate that. China has 
squarely laid the blame for the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine on the doorstep of NATO, the EU, and the United States. China has chosen to interfere with the European security architecture by signing on to a joint agreement with the, uh, to a joint statement with the Russians about um, Russian um, demands for reversing some security integration in the central uh, and eastern part of Europe. And China has also kept Russia afloat militarily. Formally, they have not overstepped the red line that was formulated by the West. They have not sent rifles, they have not sent cannons, but they have sent technology that really helps the Russians effectively. So, um, I would say that today the view that you cannot, from our perspective, you cannot drive a wedge between China and Russia, that these two th actors and these two theaters are interconnected is the prevailing view. China and Russia as totalitarian dictatorships are in a way joint at the hip like Siamese twins. But there are two more reasons why the mood in Europe vis-a-vis -vis China has soured beyond what I just sketched. One is that China has tried to use the Ukraine war to hurt European interests in the global south. They have not only peddled uh, Russian narratives against Europe there, they have also tried effectively to uh, crowd out European um, business uh, in, in that part of the world increasingly. And another reason, Europe is becoming increasingly aware that because of the economic difficulties inside China, of which Noah has spoken, there is a huge risk that a highly subsidized export of Chinese manufacturing overcapacities will very heavily inflict damage on the European economy. You have seen the, the EV probe that the European Commission has started, but when you would listen to, let's say, the European Chamber of Commerce in China, they would tell you that this is by far not the only industrial sector where Europe uh, would be adversely uh, impacted. So to sum that up, for economic reasons, but primarily for the fact that China with regard to Europe's security has decided to touch, to hurt, a core interest of Europe and our shared security, the security architecture that is a core interest of Europe. Because of that, the effect of the war and the effect of the role that they're playing in the war is very clear and clearly negative as regards EU-China relations. There are still some voices, corporate voices, uh, that pretend that they continue putting too many eggs in that one Chinese basket. Um, that's probably not more than 10 companies altogether, uh, but the prediction is and the tendency is economic facts, even if these uh, companies may not be overly patriotic or uh, defending European interests, but economic facts will make sure that the tendency will not be reversed. So China started to lose Europe during the pandemic and it has definitely lost Europe uh, in the Ukraine war. Thanks, Lara, and um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be back at 
Rosina and back in Delhi. Um, I'm a bit daunted talking about supply chains with Noah here, but I'm drawing comfort from being flanked by my German friends. I feel very secure. Um, I, I'm going to start off, um, I hope, with some comments that dovetail uh, with, with Noah's uh, and Reinhardt's especially. And I, yeah, I've just been in Europe and I think you laid out very well our impression of uh, the shift in posture across most of Europe vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis China and from our point of view that's very welcome and I think that this theme of the interconnectedness of security in Europe and the Indo-Pacific especially but also of course with the Middle East is, is very real and increasingly um, important to recognise and build into our partnerships and our policies. Uh, I was at a dinner hosted by External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar last night where Lord Mandelson from the UK gave a <laughs> a very uh, urbane and passionate uh, defence of the era of globalisation. And I thought he laid out the case for globalisation very, very well. And it was quite um, compelling. Um, but I have to say, to me, as an Australian uh, sitting where we sit right now, it had a sort of elegiac uh, quality to it because, um, of course, we recognise that era, the last three decades, were a time of exceptional prosperity globally and in our region and for Australia. Few countries benefited more from that, that three decades than Australia. Of course, much of our region also grew rapidly and developed. And um, above all, perhaps, ironically, China benefited more from that, that three decade long order than, uh, than almost any other country. Um, I guess my contention is that uh, that era is over and I, I don't have a, a, a name for the trend that I'm going to talk about, but um, I, I will try a few. Um, in, that, in that era that I was describing in terms of uh, uh, where we sit in government, uh, it was in many ways a simpler world. It was more interconnected and complex, I guess, in some respects, but, but in terms of uh, security policy and economic policy, it was possible to keep these things in their own separate silos to a very large degree and the security professionals worried about security issues and the economic policy makers worried about the economy. I'm sure that's familiar. And what that meant for us and for many other countries was that we could prioritise um, the use of our, uh, of our taxpayers' uh, revenue on uh, economic development and and social development and, frankly, um, uh, free ride a little on, 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 the, um, on the security order, of course, underwritten mostly by US military power. And it was a, it, it was a, a golden era. Uh, I guess my point is whether we call it deglobalisation, what we're starting to go through now, or the securitisation of uh, global economics or perhaps the re-securitisation of global economy, economics, which is not a phrase that I expect to catch on, um, w we know what, we, we can see it and feel it every day, you know, the focus on supply chains uh, that Noah was talking about, uh, on foreign investment and how we manage it, on critical infrastructure and just overnight, of course, we woke up to news that the Biden administration's taken <coughs> steps around cyber security at American ports and reshoring of uh, of large cranes, uh, in uh, the, the manufacture of large cranes, um, food and energy security right back to the fore and, and economic uh, coercion, as, as Reinhard mentioned, something which, of course, Australia has experienced recently and is perhaps only now just getting to the end of. All of these issues have come right to the fore. For me, in my work uh, daily, one of the biggest surprises, I think, is how much time I spend not just with my national security uh, colleagues, uh, but with a much wider range of Australian government departments and agencies, with our, with our Treasury, with our Industry Department, with our Education Department, with our Climate and Energy Department. And of course, this is very much symptomatic of, of the breaking down of the two silos I described. But the other thing that has surprised me is how much time I spend in uh, corporate boardrooms, uh, briefing boards and chief executive officers of our biggest companies, vice-chancellors of our universities also, 
frankly, a few years ago, if I would ask for a meeting with some of these guys, um, they didn't really want to hear from me because when the security agencies uh, turn up at the door, it's invariably bad news and uh, they were quite happy uh, 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 reaping uh, huge premium profits uh, over, that, over that period I described. But interestingly, there's been a complete reversal and now there's a very strong demand signal from our private sector for engagement with us and, with, and for exchanging information and again I think that's a symptom of this of this new period. Um, uh, as those silos break down new partnerships are becoming much more important. Uh, I can give uh, security advice, intelligence advice on threats to our critical infrastructure but I can't tell you in detail how Australia's power grid works or how our ICT networks are fitted together and where the vulnerabilities are. I can only do that in partnership with our with our regulators and with the providers, of course, of those uh, of those uh, networks and services. And the same thing applies internationally. I think, uh, obviously, Australia is part of very long-standing uh, Five Eyes intelligence and security relationships, but uh, it, that is uh, that is still very important. But it's it's uh, it's necessary, but not sufficient. We are building new partnerships with a, a, a much wider range of countries, countries like India, uh, where I've, I've had very good bilateral discussions over the last few days with Japan, with uh, the Republic of Korea, with a range of Southeast Asian and Pacific countries, and also increasingly in Europe, uh, which I think points to uh, the trends that Reinhardt was uh, speaking to very eloquently. And I think these partnerships will only uh, keep growing. What's driving this new phase? Uh, I think it's in many ways as a sort of history buff, it's more of a, a return to something recognisable from the past uh, and maybe globalisation was, was an enjoyable aberration. Um, I think the, the, the rise or perhaps again it's the re-rise of state capitalism uh, which, um, which in many ways Noah was, was outlining, the return of geopolitics and of course the deep structural uh, competition between uh, China and the United States for uh, for primacy in the Indo-Pacific region uh, in in the first instance, but ultimately globally. And what we see is shifting trade flows. And Noah spoke very eloquently about that. I won't I won't go into it in detail. But more important, I think, is the shift in investment trends that he also started to point to. These are longer term. Um, as Noah said, but they will have much more profound effects in terms of uh, the structure of emerging supply chains and also uh, the nature of emerging innovation and networks of innovation. Uh, and the outcomes of that process will have a significant influence on, on power, um, on, on economic power, on military power, um, on... on um, on the, on the future of innovation and emerging and critical technology. Not only will it determine power, it will also, I think, shape, uh, shape new partnerships, as I said, and also uh, new alignments. Um, in case it sounds like I'm feeling happy about the world that I'm talking about, uh, I'm not. Um, it, it does mean I work in a growth industry. Um, uh, but I'm not happy about it because, uh, after all, we're all taxpayers, I'm a taxpayer, and what this points to is a much less optimal uh, outcome for us all. It will be less economically efficient. Uh, I think it means that governments uh, and uh, the private sector are going to have to work together to strike a new balance between economic growth and resilience, uh, and that takes us into all the, all the language about friend-shoring and... Uh, reshoring and de-risking and so forth. It's also going to um, come into tension with our other goals. Uh, finding the right balance uh, in terms of the security of our future renewable energy power grids uh, is going to be very, very important. Um, if we are too drastic in our security response to what I think will be a challenging threat surface for all of us, we risk delaying the transition to net zero and increasing the cost of the energy transition. On the other hand, uh, if we are naive about some of the risks we could be building in 
uh, to tomorrow's power uh, network, um, some, of the, some of the challenges that we're seeing elsewhere. So I think uh, what this all points to is a world where we have to keep working as hard as possible to, to, to remain open and interconnected, but that the balance inevitably is going to be uh, different between security and economic prosperity. I don't think we're heading for a fully decoupled world, but I think in some sensitive sectors we are going to see extensive de um, uh, bifurcation in, in advanced areas of technology, which will be uh, transformational. We will have a less globalised, more fragmented uh, world with slower growth and higher prices. Uh, and that's very unfortunate uh, for us and for our children and for our grandchildren, I suspect. But um, I think that's the world we are heading into. On this happy note, um, <laughs> we, now, we, are, we are five speakers here speaking about five completely different issues. So, so thank you for, for, joining, uh, uh, for joining us and, and for accepting the challenge uh, to, to be addressed with five different issues over lunch. Um, and let me add something on the transatlantic relationship. <coughs> um, and, and I will just briefly talk about three points, about Putin, about security and about elections. And I start with Vladimir Putin because I believe that the, the discussion about the transatlantic relationship and the elections in the United States is especially dangerous when it comes to the projection of the election. And we can see that right now. Vladimir Putin started a war of aggression against Ukraine to change the European security order. He did not achieve any of his military aims, but he believes because of the projection of the US elections that there might be a political opening later. And this is his theory of winning at the moment, continuing the war until maybe elections somewhere else will give him an opening to continue. This projection is leading to, I think, the key question that we have right now, between now and the elections in the United States, how can the Europeans get their act together to support Ukraine militarily, financially, in the humanitarian dimension and politically to make Ukraine sustain and to come over that moment while Putin still has his theory of winning. He is not winning, but he hopes for a political opening. That's why the projection of the election is dangerous. And <clears throat> I think the Europeans are still not doing what is necessary for this period of time. Munich Security Conference did not bring the results that should have been brought about. I think we need a European special effort now, and we had European summits about everything. I think we need a summit now for immediate help to Ukraine to bridge this gap, at least until the election. Second point, security. European defense budgets are on the rise because of the threat perception by, uh, posed by Russia. Uh, this was a long way coming, and we really, from a German point of view, we really tried to avoid it. But somehow uh, uh, it was unavoidable and now the defense investment is coming. Um, but look how the defense investment is spent when you see through a lens of transatlantic relationship. Germany has a special fund of 100 billion euro in addition to the defense budget uh, uh, that was decided right after the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Out of the 100 billion, roughly 50 billion are spent to American defense companies or to defense companies that are joint ventures of European and American that may produce in Europe, but still have an American context. This transatlantic relationship will continue. This is long lasting industry technology relationship that is now heavily invested in. And Germany is just one country. All the European countries are going in a similar way. And I think the, the, the quota of a, a defense, European defense investment that strengthens the transatlantic relationship is similar in many countries as it is in Germany right now. I would not underestimate this factor. This is a, a stabilizing factor in the transatlantic relationship. And finally, elections. We're hearing this very often. We, we also heard this at the opening at this conference yesterday. There are elections in many, many countries and billions of people will vote this year. I do not understand why is this bad? Why is this dangerous? Why are we afraid of people uh, going into elections? 
There is, the, there is this negative mood about elections that something bad will happen if people are democratically, uh, democratically voting in elections. I mean, yes, the problem with elections is that in the uh, most of the cases you don't know what the result would be. But that's also the beauty of it. There, there might be the great chance of strengthening uh, the transatlantic relationship, strengthening the mandate uh, for help for Ukraine. Uh, there is uh, uh, there are many positive developments that might come out of elections. We should also focus on that and not run around only with this doom and gloom perspective. Oh, elections! Something something bad is coming to us. It's by the by the way also not helping the democratic cause uh, uh, if we are uh, talking about elections that way. The election campaign can be very dangerous. Because there's a commercial logic to this that everybody seems to make money and is happy to report about crazy stuff that is said by people during an election campaign. We should be, we, we have lived through this already. We should be adult enough not to discuss uh, uh, every word that somebody utters at a campaign meetings somewhere in the United States. We should focus on what we uh, uh, can do to help Ukraine to stop the war of aggression from Russia and to provide for European security. I think that is what the Europeans have to do and that is something we have to do regardless of who will be president in the United States. Does anybody have questions? Uh, we'll start back table, yes. Um, let's see, I don't know if we have mics to pass. One second, we may have. Oh, sure. time that we've seen so many elections in 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 one year um the the very first one that happened this year one of the first ones aside from bangladesh was was taiwan no and a, a lot was a lot of was projected in terms of all that could go wrong vis-a-vis -vis how china would react and i think the immediate message um even with the u.s delegation that was sent was one of assurance as well and also deterrence, but the assurance message was, was, was key. I think that the one that bothers everybody, and one that everybody's more anxious about outside of the United States, is the United States because of its role internationally and because of the uncertainty and unpredictability um, of what might come after. But Nico, I wanted to ask you a specific question um, about what you said on, on Ukraine. I mean, the 1st of February was supposed to, in the, the 1st of February meeting of leaders in the EU where the 50 billion um, was to be decided was supposed to be the summit that laid out what the um, promises were or was to give practical meaning to the promises that EU leaders had made. Um, what is going to follow on from that 1st of February meeting? Because on the eve of that meeting, a number of European heads of states led by um, Chancellor Olaf Scholz said, Mio culpa, uh, we failed to deliver our promises. Europe is coming together. There are other actors that ob obviously have to help Europe, but Europe too has to get it right. So I was at Munich. I agree with you, it's a doom, doom and gloom, but what comes after the 1st of February summit, which was, I understood, to be the very first um, attempt to begin to provide clarity to the promises that Europe made um, alongside its other partners. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Kevin Kelly. I'm the Irish ambassador here in uh, New Delhi. So thank you very much. This is a very interesting discussion. I also wanted to react to Nico. And uh, whereas I'm all for optimism, uh, I'm very glad Comfort mentioned that I think the anxiety is about the US election. But also, I think, for good reasons uh, in terms of what happened the last time. And so, whereas I very much support the idea of being having an optimistic lens and thus create a self-fulfilling prophecy, I do think that we have to learn from what happened the last time. 
during a previous Trump administration, and if there is a, a Trump too, that we go into that with a better degree of preparation. So I wouldn't be overly uh, dismissive of about the concern around elections. I do think they need to be prepared. And secondly, another just uh, a question just to ask. You were saying, I think Nico uh, as well, about Europe and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a European country, uh, Ireland, you know, we've been very strong in terms of, of Ukraine's uh, European perspective and supporting, you know, additional support. What more do you think specifically Europe should do in relation to Ukraine? Do you not think that, uh, so far at least, that, that that's that part of the world that we've shown the strongest leadership, despite some differences within the European uh, union, but we have shown ultimately quite strong leadership and support for, for Ukraine. But if you could be specific in terms of what's needed. Thank you. Would you all like to respond to to those and then we'll, I'll get to everybody, you don't worry. I, uh, I, 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 see, time, I see so. we are short on time. I, I try uh, to do that very briefly. Um, well, on the, on the Europeans, I mean the, 15 bi the 50 billion um, assistance from the European Union to Ukraine was decided. When it comes to the military bit, there was a plan to have a long-term assistance that is 20 billion euro, it will now be 5 billion euro and there needs to be a new decision after that. So that's less than promised, but it's moving into the right direction. At the same time, uh, many European countries such as uh, UK, France, Germany already have signed, are signing bilateral security assistance agreements with Ukraine. And for Ukraine, this will provide a patchwork of support. Uh, uh, there are two steps that I think are very important when it comes to Ukraine right now. One is digging deep into what is available right now and deliver it to Ukraine right now. And buy everything from the world markets right now and deliver it to Ukraine right now to bridge the gap that I talked about. This is psychologically also very important to provide a sense of hope uh, to those fighting in Ukraine who are faced with reluctant Europeans, Americans blocking themselves, and a media overreaction. If a small city is captured by Russia, uh, everybody is running around, oh, Russia broke through, it's over, it's hopeless. Uh, uh, so, I mean, the latter, we should not do that, but it's, 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 it's a, a media reaction. So that's one. The second is, I am convinced that the way to end this war is to invite Ukraine to NATO to start accession talks with NATO. Putin started this war to change the European security order. If we want to have peace, we need to give an answer on the level of the European security order. And that is where the US and Germany are blocking this right now, by the way, independent from any re-election result. So convincing the White House and the Chancellor's office to change their perspective there, I think that is, that is very crucial. Uh, and when it comes to to the elections in the U.S., I, I, I understand all the I understand all the concern, but we cannot influence the election result. And expressing worries every day does not actually help anybody. So if we are worried about something, we have to do concrete steps right now, especially when it comes to defense industry, because we will not be able to fight the Russian troops with money. We need the production capabilities, and that's where I see the key point. There is leadership in Europe from Scandinavian, from Baltic countries, and if we just follow what Estonia did with uh, sp everybody spending 0.25% of their GDP on help for Ukraine, then I think the situation in Ukraine would improve very rapidly. Um. Hi, um, my name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East-West Center and a Senior Advisor at the Center for Naval Analysis in the U.S. Um, thank you for a terrific panel, but I, my questions are really to Noah Barkin. Two questions. Given the diversi diversification efforts that you described with the data, uh, question one is, um, to what extent do you think national policies, such as U.S. policy on the BUILD Act and IRA, et cetera, are further required to incentivize diversification if it's already happening for the reasons that you've outlined. And second, you talked about diversification efforts by market, by sector, et cetera. Uh, I'd like to know if there's any data sets on who's diversifying in terms of country companies. I know that some of these are cross companies and all, but we've heard that Germany's actually increased 
its research and R&D centers, as well as company investments in China, BASF, et cetera. So I'd just like to talk on those two questions. And how, if you're advising our Congress in thinking about further incentivization for friend, onshoring, insuring, friendshoring, whatever you want to call it, how much money should we put out if companies are going this way anyways for the reasons that are organic to the market conditions? Oh, sure, we can collect. Um, yeah, we'll we'll take I don't know, roughly. Mm, okay, let's see. How many people? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Oh. Um, maybe I'll try to answer that those two questions together, um, I think what we've seen is that uh, in, the, in the business surveys that Japanese companies are the ones that say, well, what, Japanese companies are the ones that are saying they're, they're ramping down investments in China the most. After that, it's US companies, uh, and after that, EU. Uh, and Germany it stands out within the EU as a country uh, that is actually where many companies are saying, the few, fewest companies are saying they're going to ratchet back investments uh, in China. So I think uh, we've heard, for example, from the German Chancellor, and I don't think he's the only one who said this, that it, it's really up to companies to decide uh, whether to diversify and how to diversify. And I think that's, there's a strain, uh, a strong strain of that in Europe um, among countries that are traditional, traditional free trading countries uh, that one shouldn't tell companies uh, what to do, um, uh, that one shouldn't tell companies where to invest. This is, we've had a debate in Europe recently about the outbound investment uh, whether to introduce an outbound investment regime. Uh, and, and I think there is, to some extent, that is, that is true, that uh, companies uh, will are, are, have different incentives than, than governments. But uh, I think what the difference between US companies and German companies, for, uh, for example, is that US companies know that the US and China are heading towards a long strategic competition. Uh, that we're, we're at the beginning of a, of a long period of strategic competition. I think there are German companies that still believe that in a few years, maybe this will blow over, um, that uh, uh, perhaps the geopolitical tensions will, will be reduced. Maybe there will be political changes. We talked about elections that, that change the, the calculus. Um, so uh, I think that's the difference in terms of the, the investment. And I think when I look at the US, I think the US has put in place measures, pretty strict measures in to, to tell companies there are certain, certain red lines. Um, I think Europe probably still has some work to do there. Um, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has launched this European Economic Security Agenda. That is slow going. There's a lot of resistance from the member states to this. Um, but I think the, the, what we've seen in Europe is that if governments don't place certain red lines on, uh, introduce certain regulations, then it's not going to happen. Um, so I'm less worried about the US uh, than I am about Europe. Well, I disagree a little bit. Um, certainly there are all the shortcomings that Noah described, but um, we have one extremely strong support in making sure that we will be going in the direction that I described, and that is the Chinese leadership. I mean, there have been so many opportunities for Europe to lose track where the Chinese helped us to 
to find the right direction. And I count on that. And the even though some of the companies have that inclination that Noah described, they cannot go against economic reality. And as long as China was not competing with advanced German technology, it was easy to talk about win-win. And it was easy to ignore that China didn't stick to WTO rules. But as soon as these companies become your competitor because they move up through the value chain, that's a completely different story. And if they now intervene in the sectors that we pride ourselves as leading technologically, that's a different story. And I count on these economic facts. Yeah, and we just put out a note uh, a week ago on this very uh, dynamic that, that Reinhardt is describing that German companies in industries that they once dominated are coming under increasing pressure from Chinese competition and that, uh, well, it's, it's the economy, stupid. I think it's the economy that have encouraged German companies to remain committed to China and it will probably in the end be the economy that uh, the economic competition that convinces them to pull back or, or change their approach. Um, all right, so we have this room for about another 25 minutes. We will, uh, I'm sorry if I did not get to all of your questions, but that does not mean you cannot come up and uh, approach them. We'll all be sitting around. Um, if, can you guys hear me okay? So please feel free to keep asking questions. We're just going to take it back to the back to the room now. But thank, thank you all so much. This has been absolutely fantastic. Sure.